Well, hello, viewers, voyeurs. Welcome. You're with Got That Funk. Thank you for joining me. Um, just uh, doing the whole pandemic thing, hanging out, waiting for life to return back to some semblance of normality. Uh, not in any particular hurry for that to happen since the, uh, the government here in the UK is, um, how shall I put this, screwing things up completely. And uh, it's not going much better in America, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. Our country wants to open. The governors, it's in their hands, but our country wants to open. And you see what's going on. They have to open. And the people of our country should think of themselves as warriors. Our country has to open. So the president wants Americans to consider themselves to be warriors. And that's something I find particularly alarming and disturbing. Um... You know, I mean, he's trying to act like some kind of uh, a cheerleader and pretend that he's doing it uh, in everyone's best interests rather than for his own agenda. Um, and uh, calling on the country to uh, civilians to consider themselves to be warriors, um, it, it just plain disturbs me. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, not for this reason, but I just think it's, uh, it, it, there's no draft going on. You can't be conscripted into becoming a warrior just because tr the president tells you that you are, right? Trump can't declare war anyway as president of the United States. Uh, only Congress can declare war. But, you know, I know it's a metaphor. I get it. I'm not dumb. But uh, let's, let's just take it as a metaphor then for a second. Um, Surely if you're a warrior uh, against the invisible enemy, which is COVID-19, if you're a warrior against the disease, you would want your behavior to be the most likely to help vanquish the disease. Being a warrior against a disease doesn't mean letting it kill as many of your people as it possibly can while you just get on with your lives. That's not what being a warrior is against a disease. Trump wants you to volunteer to risk your life for whatever paltry wages you may or may not make um, for his own electoral benefit. He, he's calculated that uh, uh, and he's had um, help from Congress in this regard because, you know, they haven't really given people sufficient means to survive a, a shelter at home order. Uh, so I put an awful lot of blame on Congress for what's going on right now. But um, so I, I, I see Congress as the other side of this problem and Trump as uh, the instigator in making things go wrong. I mean, the fact is, last week when um, we had armed protesters showing up at state houses in various different parts of the country and Trump basically did nothing to discourage that and, in fact, told Governor Whitmer of Michigan that uh, she should talk to these people because, you know, they're good people and they have legitimate grievances and you need to sit down and talk to them. And I find it very disturbing that any president of any party says, hey, these guys have guns. Listen to their political demands. That's just a really dangerous precedent to set. But I think it's equally dangerous. I mean, the president wants to call people to consider themselves as warriors. Uh, you, should just, you should just be brave enough to face death because he says so. And I know people are saying, oh, you know, hyperbole, you're not, you're not risking death. I mean, well, you know what? You've still got like around about 2,000 people every day dying in America from COVID-19. And that's after you've had five or six weeks of shelter in place orders in many parts of the country. So despite control measures, you're still dropping like flies. And if you remove those control measures, uh, even the CDC estimate is that if you remove the control measures now, uh, you'll be losing 3,000 people a day uh, this time next month. By the 1st of June, you'll be losing 3,000 a day. A 9-11 every day. And I'm old enough to remember when we lost 3,000 people on 9-11 and the nation mourned for days and days and days. I cried for days. Didn't you, if you were an adult back then? That's what 3,000 lives used to mean to us. And this invisible enemy, as Trump likes to call it, this, this virus that we're contending with, um, it's not as if we can't defeat it if we took the appropriate steps. It 
stands to reason to me, since they know how to defeat it and don't take those steps, they want people to die. I can't escape the, the really dark conclusion that there's a cull going on right now, and that's not just in America. Um, but uh, that's uh, perhaps a topic for a different video. Uh, suffice to say that, um, you know, Trump wants you to be a warrior. He wants you to risk your life for a wage uh, that barely, barely, that you can barely survive on. Um, shelter in place isn't depriving you of your liberty. Being pressed into involuntary servitude is depriving you of your liberty. And the fact is that Congress has not enabled the um, population with the means through which they can stay sheltered in place. And that is 90% on Congress. And Trump should have been pressing them to do so, but the, 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 he's never wanted people to shelter in place. They have never wanted people to shelter in place. They have never really cared about whether you live or die. And their actions bear that out. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, a little over 100 years ago, there was a, a pandemic uh, most popularly called the Spanish flu. Uh, that went on. It had three major spikes. And the second spike was considerably worse than the first spike. In fact, the second spike killed more people uh, than the entire First World War. Um, so, uh, which was also going on at the same time. So you had, you know, estimates range between 20 million and 50 million people worldwide got killed in the Spanish flu. And in America, those numbers uh, varied depending on which part of America you lived in. Uh, certain parts of Amer America had uh, easier second spikes and some had harder. It depends because different places were following different social distancing rules. And some places like San Francisco, for example, had like mask protests and everything. But some people did obviously wear masks because they valued their health and they valued the health of their families and friends and neighbors and they also could see that people were dropping like flies. Um, so in my opinion, uh, I understand that it's uncomfortable uh, for any adult especially to be told what to do or what not to do by the government. I totally understand. Um, and I understand people whose initial reaction to uh, an, an order to wear a face mask in public is to recoil and go, hey, you can't tell me what I have to wear. Um, well, that's not true. They tell you that you have to wear clothes, right? You're not allowed to walk around naked without getting arrested, right? Women aren't, aren't allowed to show their nipples in public uh, w without some um, approbation. Right. Um, and yeah, we're all we're all required to wear clothes. And since this particular item of clothes uh, could be the difference between saving someone else's life or not, I don't think it's all that much to ask. It's not a huge infringement of your liberty, considering the trade off is someone else's life. Um, you know, people who are advocating reopening early, um, in my opinion, are no better than anti-vaxxers because you're basically taking a position which says that you think that the exercise of your freedom, you know, you don't want to shelter at home anymore. You find it oppressive. You need to make money. I get the making money part, um, but you don't want to shelter in place because you don't want to be told to, you know, you don't want to volunteer for house arrest, basically. I totally understand. Um, but your freedom ends when the exercise of that freedom imperils other people's lives. And right now there is a pandemic going on, like it or not. It's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, it's a real bummer, but it's really happening and people are dying all over the goddamn world. And if you're not part of the solution, you're going to be part of the problem. And even if you think you yourself might personally catch it and you think you yourself will probably be okay, your life is yours to risk. Other people's lives are not. Let me give you an example of what I mean. 
you know, uh, if you get a driver's license, you can drive legally. It's also perfectly legal if you're over the age of 21 to drink alcohol. But you're not allowed to do both those things at the same time. Because if you do, you are unnecessarily risking public safety. You're risking not only your own life, which is your right to risk, but you're risking the lives of other people, which is not your right to do. It's an unnecessary risk to public health, right? All freedoms, all freedoms have some inherent responsibility to the exercise of those freedoms. Um, freedom without responsibility isn't freedom. That's license. That's uh, freedom without responsibility. It's just permission to do whatever you want without any consequence and Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That's just physics. So, you know, um, responsibility is, is built into the concept of freedom. You know, my right to swing my fists ends at your nose and all that sort of thing. And it's the same thing, you know, you can, uh, you can risk, you know, you, you can let people cough on you if you want to. That's your, that's your you know, prerogative. Um, you don't have the right to go coughing on other people. Uh, during a pandemic, especially, Right. Anti-vaxxers think that they have the right to risk everyone's health by not vaccinating their children. How is this any different than the anti-vaxxer position? If you think that you don't have to wear a face mask and you, and you don't have to socially distance and you can live your life the way it always was going on, and if that kills 3,000 people or more a day, so what? It's just the price we have to pay for our liberty. You've got to be kidding me for one thing. Like I say... It wasn't all that long ago in my memory anyway that we were crying and crying and crying because we lost 3,000 people on 9-11. I want to make another point as well. I mean, like, if in America right now, and they're testing less and less because they don't want the, te they don't want the numbers of positive tests to go up, so they're, they're testing less. And this is a thing you've got to keep in mind. You always have to remember that the percentage of how many testing they're due versus the it needs to be compared to how many positive tests are going up. But anyway, um, so they're doing less tests on purpose because they want to artificially make it look like the numbers are coming down. But suffice to say, even with the, even with the testing numbers of what they are, you know, we're, we're, we're gaining something like 25,000 new, new cases of COVID a day in America and losing around about 2,000 people. And like I said, if they relax the uh, social distancing restrictions and the stay-at-home orders start coming off, the CDC estimates 3,000 a day by the 1st of June. Now, let me ask you this, my viewers. If 25,000 people a day were getting mauled by sharks in the ocean and 3,000 of those people every day, every day, were getting eaten by sharks in the ocean, what restrictions do they put on going in the ocean? Any? You're free to go in there and risk getting mauled by a shark. I'm sure you're free to go and do it. But I mean, like, how smart would that be? Don't you think it would be in the, in the government's responsibility to warn people that the, the risks of being mauled or eaten by a shark are extremely high? Because, sure, only 3,000 people are going to die from those sharks, but at least 25,000 more are going to get mauled and not die. I mean, you know. They might think they're going to die and go through all the horrors of existential dread that, that is getting a deadly disease and not knowing whether you're going to survive or not until you come out the other side. You know, I mean, not dying isn't isn't necessarily um, the only thing to, to I mean, sorry, I should rephrase that. You know, dying isn't necessarily the only thing to fear from COVID-19. It's the fear of dying and all the people who care about you worrying about you dying is something that we should not just take blithely as if it's no big deal as if it's something that we warriors should just take in our stride because hey you know profit because that's what this shit comes down to it comes down to profit the people that want you to go back to work don't care about your life they care about their profit you need to care about your own well-being both your health and your financial well-being. If you feel you must protest, I support that. I support social distancing protests and responsible protesting with masks on. I absolutely support that. But I support protesting for the right reasons. Protest for your right to stay at home. Protest for your right to be adequately fed and clothed and sheltered until the pandemic is 
the, the peak of the pandemic has passed us sufficiently so that we can then start phasing people back into the workforce via testing so that we're only letting people who are tested safe to go back out into the workforce. That's the only safe way to go about it. Same with school. We've got a whole summer ahead of us. We could be testing all the kids before they go back to school next year. There's no excuse not to test kids. Schools are going to be one of the major vectors for any disease. They always have been. Any parent knows kids come home ill all the time from stuff they catch at school. And what you don't want them coming home with is a deadly disease that might kill them or yourself. No one is immune from this disease. It doesn't matter what age bracket you're in. Uh, if you catch it, you could die. So uh, I want you to keep all that in mind. Um, and I just want to say here in the UK, it's rumored that Boris Johnson is going to try to ease the lockdown restrictions uh, early next week, which is the most asinine suggestion I think I've ever heard. Uh, when we went into lockdown, we were losing dozens of people every day. Now we're still losing over 600 people every day. So it's worse now than it was then. And that's despite the fact that we've been locked down for six or seven weeks. Hospitals still have inadequate PPE. Nurses and doctors, we've lost more than 150 of them in two months. The, um, the disease was allowed, I think, on purpose personally to uh, ravage through um, retirement homes all over the country. Um, the elderly population has been hit particularly hard by COVID-19. And uh, anybody whose attitude is, well, hey, you know, they were old, they probably had other conditions and, you know, hey, they were probably going to die in the next year or two anyway, and blah, blah, blah. You know, if that's your attitude, you're a cold son of a person. You're not a nice person. If that's your attitude, if that's your attitude, I think you need to check yourself and put yourself in someone else's shoes. Stop thinking of the world as a game where as long as you don't lose, it doesn't matter who does. We're all in this together. And if you don't care about other people, you should not be surprised if no one else cares about you. And personally, I want people to care about me. Okay, I think I'm done with my little preaching for, for this particular video. Anyway, I want to thank you for watching. And until next time, may all your ups and downs be ups. Good luck.